We have a great lineup this afternoon um, that you're going to be really excited about that is going to weave us through digital storytelling, open content, creative licensing, and providing the largest, broadest open access um, for that content. We will start off with uh, hearing from Ashlyn Sparrow of the Weston Game Lab at the University of Chicago. She's going to talk about work she's doing with young digital creators in developing games, platforms, and other apps to tell their stories. After, we will hear from Ryan Merkley, from the, who is the CEO of Creative Commons. And he will be talking about unleashing creativity for authors that he's working with through robust Creative Commons licensing and the roles librarians play um, in this new era of storytelling. After that, John Bracken will be introducing uh, Doran Weber and Catherine Mayer from Wikimedia Foundation, and they will continue the conversation based on some of the information we hear from Ryan and from Ashlyn. So with that, I'd like to welcome Ashlyn to the stage. Hello everyone. My name is Ashlyn Sparrow. I'm the assistant director of the Weston Game Lab. And before I talk about how I engage young people in creating in their own games and telling their own stories, I'd like to take you through the thoughts and philosophies that kind of lead up to this work. And it's always important because I work with young people in Chicago to kind of talk about a tale of two Chicagos here. So I'm not originally from Chicago, I've been here for six years now, but when I was told I was moving to Chicago, I thought that this was the thing that I would be seeing all the time, right? It's so sparkly, it's so beautiful, and I'm like, wow, as a small time person from Pennsylvania, like I've made it in life, whatever that means. But very quickly, because I worked with young people, I got to experience what their reality actually was, right? And I, too, live in Woodlawn, where things are actually gentrifying really quickly. And so I really got to understand, oh, there are actually different Chicagos for different people, depending on where you live. So this actually brings us to kind of this idea around structural violence. You all, smart, educated people in the room, understand what this is. But this, it's, it's really thinking about, well, how do the young people in Chicago experience the systems that they're interacting with, right? And thinking that it's not necessarily just the individual people, but it's actually about collectively how things work. I used to work with a medical doctor, and so she really uh, used this term with me, syndemics. And so now it's thinking about, well, how do different uh, psychosocial and health problems overlap to actually create a, an, a, an amplifying effect, whether that's for harm or for social good? So this is the kind of work that has uh, is the basis at the Weston Game Lab at the University of Chicago. It is a new center. We are seven weeks old, so I'm still using like architectural images. Thank you, thank you. I feel like I'm surviving, I'm like, wow, okay, what's next? Um, and so this is the type of work that we're interested in doing here at the lab and continuing to build that out. So now that you understand the philosophy of Chicago, now I want to talk a little bit about games and why they're important. Fun fact, they've overtaken the movie industry. Uh, they, is it a $20 billion industry? Um, that number has actually increased because when I first created this slide, it was like in 2013. So like, <laughs> there's no point of updating it. Like, the number's large, right? So I always want to talk about the affordances of games. Games are really good at these four major things. They provide players agency, right? A game does not move forward without a, per a player doing something in the game. They are really good at trial and error, right? Like it is one of the only mediums where people will try and fail over and over and over again and be like, I got this. No, this time, it, we're, we're making it happen, right? Imagine if other systems in the world were designed that way. So that also means it's a safe place for failure. And it's really good at taking abstract systems and making it concrete, right? Like I know how uh, nanobots work because I play games, or I know how galaxies are created because I play games. 
And so there are kind of two high-level categories when we think about games um, in the kind of educational game space. There are entertainment games, and then there are serious games. And entertainment games are the basic games that have been designed. The intention is for pure entertainment, right? For funsies, as my young people like to say. But serious games, while they are serious sometimes in nature, what we're really talking about is that they're designed for other purposes outside of entertainment, right? So thinking about education, thinking about uh, weight loss, thinking about simulation games, how these all kind of interact. I'm going to throw out this very long quote, but don't worry, I'll read it to you. So some folks, uh, so some game theorists talk about, des describe games and define games in this way, and I really like this definition. A game is a rule-based system with a variable and quantifiable outcome where different outcomes are assigned different values. The player exerts effort in order to influence the outcome. The player feels emotionally attached to the outcome and the consequences of the action are negotiable. I like bullet points, so like, there are like six things that make a game. But if we think about it, that's very abstract, right? Which could almost say, well, you know, life is kind of like a game. Right? Life has very variable and quantifiable outcomes, right? We as the people are negotiating what those outcomes are, right? And, and collectively we've decided what they should or should not be. And so that leads me to working with young people and thinking about, well, how might we work together to create games about issues that you think are important and then actually take that and start thinking about the systems we interact with and make social change. Um, I'm going to skip a couple slides because I know that my time is limited up here. So I want to mention that game mechanics are very important to think through. That these are the actions that a player takes within a game. And that also, games may have the, uh, the ability to support existing social and cultural positions. Right? They might be able to support it or they might be able to disrupt it. And so just like words have rhetoric and meaning, well, maybe games have that as well. That every game mechanic, every action that a player can take can also make meaning in the real world. Think about a game like Call of Duty, where all you're doing is shooting and ducking and throwing grenades. Those are the actions a player can take, but if we extrapolate that, is that what the military is? My dad was in the military for 20 years, and I play these games in front of him all the time, and he's like, yeah, see, we want to always de-escalate that. We don't want that to happen. <laughs> So then a mechanic should actually be talking, right? Like having fun with local civil civilians, right? Trying to build relationship because you don't want that to happen, right? And so this is where the learning gets really interesting and this is why I think games are really important. And so this is the work that I do in the lab with young people. And so Together, what we do for four weeks in the summer is we have them design their own games. We stick primarily to board games and card games because we actually were dealing with a system of inequality where different schools have different uh, tech, ac uh, tech access, right? But no one really has designed a board game or card game, and so this is actually a great place to start. And so we're getting students from all over Chicago who don't know each other, they don't know where, we're from, where they're from, and they've never gone to other people's neighborhoods. And so now they're talking, they're communicating, they're collaborating together. They're thinking about, well, what's common in both of our neighborhoods that we actually think is very important? And we bring them to the university so that they can actually think about, well, this campus that feels very exclusive is actually yours for the taking. So how might you think about and interact with like, medical doctors and lawyers and policymakers to create your game and think about the implications of your work outside of this four-week program. They learn about rapid prototyping. They learn about safe failure, right? And the feeling of that adults are their accomplices. That I, as the person who has power, I actually don't have the answers for everything, right? I don't know 99% of the things that are happening in the world, but together we can go on a journey. And they've actually managed to create some amazing games, and I'll just really, really quickly like go through all of them. Um, just really like, just, just, just bear with me. Okay. So in the top, like whatever corner this is right here, um, is a game about, uh, teaching, uh, people that you, just because you might take certain actions in the world, uh, or you might have certain risk behaviors, it doesn't mean that you always know who is actually going to end up getting pregnant, right? So stop assuming, stop slut shaming people, right? And I'm like, you go, yes, 
right? We're gonna move in this direction. This group was like, well, you know what? A lot of our peers are sexually active, but they don't know anything about STIs. So we're gonna actually teach them about that, and we're gonna work with some medical residents, uh, uh, some medical fellows, to help kind of build this educational component. Um, this game is my favorite game. It's called UF Obesity. And they're like, well, oh, it's so good. It's so, let me tell you, the setup. You are an overweight child who's been abducted by aliens. And you are trying to run, burn calories, and escape the spaceship. I'm like, wow, tell me more. <laughs> the aliens represent different social pressures, which will try and prevent you from escaping. So some aliens will fat shame other people. And I'm like, wow, that's so real. No, that's so much. right? Some aliens will try and force feed you. I'm like, wow, this is a lot. right? All for the purpose of trying to get people to understand, well, it's actually not only just about physicality of losing weight, but there's a lot of social pressures as well. And then the last game is about teen pregnancy. And so this is a game where students were like, well, we don't want people to, uh, to continuously think that your life is over when you have a baby. So how might we continue the game if you happen to have a baby and get pregnant? How might we change the goals of the game so that you can still win and succeed in life? So those are the things that I focus on in my lab happen to talk about it with any of you here. I'm pretty sure my time has been up like a long time ago, so I'm gonna leave. <laughs> Goodbye. Good. This is great. <laughs>
the new web, the one that is powered by these black box algorithms, by surveillance capitalism and walled gardens, is undoing a generation's work of work around collective action, our collective action. And not that many remnants remain of our uh, old ideals, but the best of it lives in what we now know as the commons, or in projects like Wikipedia, or in libraries and archives, both digital and physical, which is why it's a treat to be here at this conference talking with all of you. As I mentioned, there's over one and a half billion licensed works in the commons, but that digital commons that we know today is at risk, as the business models that have supported content creation and the web are breaking and under their new model or under their old models, the commons is at risk as being taken down with their collapse. I'm fond of reminding people that the foundations that copyright is built on, for example, which underpins much of content creation, are old and creaky. Um, copyright was established in England in, in 1662, just in case you didn't know, to regulate the copying of printed books and pamphlets. Now, since then, you might argue that copyright and the world around it has changed a little. Um, not just who can make copies, but how many, how often, and who makes those original works. I looked this up because it brings me joy. In 1662, when this law was written, there were 1,018 booksellers and printers at work in England, Ireland, and Scotland. This is who the original law was written for, according to a book aptly titled The Dictionary of Booksellers and Printers Who Were at Work in England, Ireland, and Scotland <laughs> from 1641 to 1667 by Henry R. Plomer. Henry did me a big favor by writing that book. So that's who the laws were written for, 1,018 people. The world has changed a little bit because today every single one of you holds copyright and any one of you who made anything today holds copyright over that work automatically whether you like it or not for the rest of your life plus 70 years after that. So maybe those laws might need a change. But today's debates about the future sustainability of journalism and music and academic publishing and data sharing, user-generated content platforms and photography too often omit a very important fact about the digital commons, that it is dependent on the goodwill of those platforms and the commercial viability of those companies. We've been a free rider for almost uh, for a very significant portion of the commons. Not all of it lives on nonprofit platforms supported by individual donors. Much of it lives on for-profit platforms who are the benevolent dictators of that content. According to our most recent State of the Commons report, which we publish annually, over one-third of the content in the commons is hosted on those platforms. Now, every content publisher right now today is looking for a new model. In the boardrooms where those models are being conceived, we are not invited. There is little or no discussion about how to replace them with new ethical models that benefit the commons. And how much better would it be if supporting the commons and sharing was embedded in those business models, not just a ride-along? Most of these struggling industries are adapting, or mutating might be a better term. Streaming apps went and made deals with publishers uh, and cut out the artist. This is my friend Danny Michelle, who tells a story of how, for years, he was able to sustain his music career. He's a popular Canadian musician. I'm from Toronto. Um, and for years was able to sustain his career. But this year, with a number three album on the charts, his total revenue from that album is $45 from streaming on Spotify. Now, there's lots of money in the system. It's just not going to artists. Publishers did the deal with Spotify. And if you look at Spotify's IPO documents and read them, the only way Spotify ever makes money, ever, no matter how many users, no matter how much music, the only way they make money in their prospectus is if they pay artists less, less than 45 bucks. Academic publishing is trying to buy up preprint repositories and look for new models to work around open access. Education is moving to a rental model for content where you don't buy your textbooks, you borrow them for a while and you don't own them. We need new models. We need libraries, librarians as the keepers, curators, and purveyors of knowledge to step up and help us build those new models. I was happy to see that call to action today uh, throughout the sessions that I was in, including this morning's opening, to embrace solutions that are built around our values and our resources and the ones that we believe in at the core of those models. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Berlin on an invitation from Wikipedia to join hundreds of community members as they develop their new 10-year vision and strategy. I wanted to mention this because I know who's coming up after me. 
Now, bravely, I think, they've acknowledged that they are probably the only organization in the world that has the trust, the reach, and the money to save and grow what we need. Accessible, equitable access to knowledge for everyone to step in and play a foundational role around sharing knowledge for everyone. Now, it was a treat for me and an honor to be able to help them think through those issues because we need them to succeed. Uh, that's proof that I was there. Um, <laughs> We all need them to succeed, and we need all of you to help them do it. Solving this challenge is vital. It's actually how we cure disease, how we fight climate change, and how we repair our broken democracies around the world. And we're going to need to look beyond traditional sectors and established business models. We'll need new ones we haven't thought of yet. We'll need to embrace the idea that those institutions we know may have to evolve and change to meet this new reality. It's going to be hard and painful, as we heard this morning. It's also essential for what's next. I'm up for it, and I think you are all too. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ashlyn. That was awesome. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce two folks. You guys can start coming up if you want, um, who have been essential to digital public libraries past and present, and hopefully the future. Uh, Catherine Marr is the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. She has been for nearly three years now. Um, I can say, as a former grant maker, um, I, Catherine inherited me as a program officer, and we had difficult times, and she was one of the more transparent, uh, clear-thinking, open, uh, and, and uh, empathetic grantees I'd ever worked with. And now, three years later, uh, she's one of my bosses as a board member of the Digital Public Library of America. And I feel very lucky. Um, Doran Weber is the vice president of the Public Understanding of Science, Technology, and Economics at the Sloan Foundation. As I said this morning, he has been a core, essential, existential partner uh, of the Digital Public Library of America from the very first meeting we had. In my home, he's famous uh, by, with my nine-year-old for having been a key funder to the what became the book and film Hidden Figures, which is one of my daughter's favorite movies. Um, and I'm just really excited that we get to kind of eavesdrop in on this conversation of two leading thinkers working through what the state of knowledge in a digital age is and what we should be excited and worried about. So, thank you. Thanks, John. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. Um, well, since John mentioned Hidden Figures, I just wanted to say, Ashton, I really loved your talk, and I think the notion of storytelling, digital or otherwise, is an incredibly powerful way to communicate. And one of the many great things that came out of Hidden Figures was that um, uh, there are now courses, there are scholarships, streets have been named after Katherine Johnson, buildings, and we're actually working with Congress at this moment for a bipartisan bill to, um, uh, to create a congressional gold medal honoring the women of hidden figures. And we actually have, the Senate has uh, signed it both sides and we have a bill in the House. So you can actually bring people together, even at a divisive time like this, around something, as Ryan mentioned, instead of just honoring the astronauts, this is about the people who did the math, who did the, the grunt work, so to speak. And, and, um, and the other point about that story is how many other hidden figures are there that, whose stories we haven't told yet. So it's very inspiring what you're doing. We're also working with games, by the way. So it's a, it's a great source. Anyway, Catherine, it's a great <laughs> pleasure to uh, be here on this stage with you. Um, why don't we start with, tell us a little bit about um, Wikipedia, where you think it is today, what, what its challenges are, what you're proud of, and then segue to DPLA, since you have a unique vantage point and you're now on the board, and what are some of the lessons from Wikipedia that can be applied to DPLA? Easy question. To Easy questions, with. yeah. <laughs> Three-part question, I'll take it in. Yeah. Um, First of all, I also just want to highlight how incredible it is. The work of storytelling around knowledge, and particularly collaborative knowledge, is something that we struggle with all the time at Wikimedia. It is so hard, I find, often to express to someone who doesn't live embedded in this world the value of knowledge that accrues over time, that is built through collaboration, that transcends cultures and languages and, and generations, really, and why that is such a fragile and precious thing, and why it requires a 
an entire sort of institution of institutions in order to defend, elevate, and continue to advocate upon its behalf. So I just want to say thank you all for being doing the work that you do because I feel as though we're really sort of sitting in conversation with you instead of just with each other. Um, and thank you in particular for those who have the words to be able to speak and describe and story tell about what it is that we're trying to accomplish in such tangible ways. Um, so Wikimedia, Wikimedia is the ecosystem of Wikipedia plus plus. It is the community members that make Wikipedia possible. It is Wikidata, the structured and open link data project. It is Wikimedia Commons, uh, which I think some, Ryan took some of those photos from. Um, it is the idea that free knowledge is not just Wikipedia, the encyclopedia, but free knowledge can be a thing that is much more resilient and robust and is not just the knowledge itself, but the community that makes it what it is. We've been around for about eight, years now, about 18 years. Um, I'm obviously with three years in, just a very small part of that history, and we think of ourselves as just stewards for the next generation. As I look at what the future is for Wikimedia and where we've come from, I'm reminded that we are the world's largest free encyclopedia. It's the world's largest compendium of open knowledge that's ever existed. It has 50 million articles across 300 languages, give or take. Um, you know, 50 million freely licensed images, free 50 million, it just happens, the 50, 50, 50 right now, 50, 50 million items in our, in our uh, wiki data set. And we estimate that that is just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what is known. Our vision statement is the sum, imagine a world in which every single human can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. But as one of our community members, Felix Nardi from Ghana likes to remind me that it is just the sum of sum of knowledge. Currently today, what Wikimedia does is it represents 50 million, as I said, 50 million concepts, but it only reaches 15% of the world's population. So we talk about the sum of all knowledge and we talk about all people, and yet we realize that we've only made such a small dent in, the, in actually representing and reaching the world. And so when we think about our future, uh, what, we've, what Ryan alluded to in terms of what our ambition is, is how do we go beyond the encyclopedia? How do we reach more people? How do we really think of this platform that reaches about a billion people on a monthly basis as a platform that can help join with other organizations that share a free knowledge mission, that share a desire to see people not just consume, but to create and participate and elevate those other missions alongside of what Wikipedia actually is to connect free knowledge more generally and more broadly around the world in ways that is multilingual, that is open, that is collaborative, and connects to the world that has not necessarily always been able to fully participate, tell their own stories, and be represented. And so that's, that's, I, that's a very abstract way of talking about what we're doing. <laughs> On the five theme, it's yeah. also the fifth largest website in the world. That's very important to emphasize. So that the, the hunger for knowledge at the end of the day, and all uh, the top 70 are all commercial. It's the only nonprofit, in the, or let, at least top 100, whatever. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so it's a remarkable achievement, right, that people actually come, even if it's only 15%, it's still hugely popular. Oh, yeah, I would say it's a remarkable achievement for humanity that the fifth most popular website on the planet is one in which people seek information. I think we should, we should appreciate that because the other top four and the top five are all consumer platforms, which is nothing wrong with that, but it really speaks to the hunger for knowledge, and I think that that's so important. But the connection to DPLA, because I realize I'm like rambling a little bit, the connection to DPLA for me is that we are all a community of knowledge seekers, and we are communities of communities, and I think that's what's really important. One of the things that is a fundamental principle of Wikimedia is that you could never run it from the center. And it would be impossible. It would never be able to grow to the scale that it's grown. It would never be able to reach the audiences it reaches. It would never be able to exist in the languages it exists in. It has to be something that emerges from the communities that it serves, and then those communities have to be supported and elevated. And our role at the center in Wikimedia Foundation, not the center, at the Wikimedia Foundation, is to invest in ways that ensure that those community that is an equity-based investment in those communities so that communities have the resources that they need in order to have their knowledge represented on the global stage. And I think that there's so much that is so similar with the function of what libraries do in their communities. And so I joined DPLA because I wanted to learn from a community of communities that is, is deeply invested in knowledge as we are at Wikimedia. So we're living in this post-truth period where everyone is worried about knowledge, how accurate it is. So tell us how Wikipedia has managed to avoid, there's relatively no fake news on Wikipedia, even though there are millions of Articles and and we there have also been studies that show that people from the left and the right tend to moderate their positions over time and move more towards the center because they know that their edits won't 
last. They won't stick. So can you address that and maybe lessons for the rest of society from, from the Wikipedia experience? <laughs> How to solve democracy from Wikipedia. No, um, <laughs> uh, it's not a bad model. No, I, I think... Uh, the reason, so I like to talk about how Wikimedia is really just an evolution of a series of knowledge traditions. And the reason why fake, we do have a list of hoaxes on Wikipedia. You can find it under Wikipedia forward slash list of hoaxes on Wikipedia. We tend to be very transparent about when we get things wrong. And I think that's really important. We start from a position that we do not know the answers. We start from a position that you shouldn't trust us. In fact, you should always check the citations. That's why the tags are there at the top. We start from a position that we have to earn the credibility with our readers and in fact, that readers should always start with a critical eye. So if that perhaps is the beginning of a, of a conversation around how we as citizens should engage in, in democracy and discourse, I think that's a good starting place. What we try to do is to bring together people in common, in conversation around commonalities and give them a place in which they can resolve differences, not necessarily through coming to agreement on the positions that they sit in, but in what we can acknowledge to be known or commonly accepted at any point in time. So for me, like Wikipedia isn't actually truth in any way. It is just what we know based on who shows up and what has been written thus far. And so therefore, it's always open to reinterpretation and reevaluation and, and continuous evolution. And in that sense, that really the knowledge traditions that it builds on are this whole method of scientific inquiry. As we have hypotheses and then we prove or disprove our hypotheses, they continue to evolve with us. We build upon an idea of, of peer review from, this, from the tradition of academia, which says that the more eyes are on any given particular project or question or idea, the better informed and the better, the better tested our ideas and selves will be. And we build on the tradition of journalism, which says, you know, trust your mother. When your mother tells you she loves you, you know, check but verify or trust but verify um, with this idea that all information should in fact be verifiable. And I think that really what you see in Wikimedia is not in fact some sort of whole scale new innovation or invention, but a codification in a digital space of the way that humans have addressed questions of knowledge integrity for many, many years. And what about the, the question of privacy and Wikipedia? You know, I'm working with Consumer Reports to push back on the um, you know, consumers having more reclaiming their digital rights. And we've recently done a study comparing about 15 companies using, it hasn't been pub released yet, but looking at w what Wikipedia collects as opposed to some of the big, the problem, let's say, with Google is Google is not one company. It actually turns out to be 200 companies. So you want to, and we have charts showing how much information each one of them collects as opposed to Wikipedia. And so can you address how you treat privacy, and again, I think how that can be a model for other organizations. Libraries are a model for the way that we treat privacy. <laughs> um, big, I'm from Connecticut. I'm a very proud, um, uh, you know, born and raised in that state, and I'm very proud of the Connecticut librarians who fought the very first national security letter successfully. Uh, we believe that that we believe that freedom of inquiry thrives with privacy, and we believe that the only way to have true freedom of thought is for people to be able to learn without being concerned about who is looking over their shoulders. And <laughs> yes, give yourselves a round of applause. And so this has been a really important principle for us in terms of the way that we think about privacy. We do not collect user data. We collect the minimum amount of data necessary in order to be able to run the sites in a way that is fast and accessible. Um, we secure everything through SSL so we can actually look at what user sessions and, browser and data people are looking at. And we also do that in order to protect them from prying eyes of ISPs and governments because in many places around the world, the very notion of being able to look something up freely is something that is politically threatening. Uh, so our belief is very much that this is not just something that we do for our users, but this is also a way to keep our own hands and noses out of trying to figure out what our users want. I think that the moment you have access to that data, the moment you start to use that data and you fall down a very slippery slope, you heard Ryan earlier speak today about the dangers of platform, ca uh, platform surveillance, or uh, sorry, surveillance capitalism. There is no question in my mind that the moment you try to start incentivizing, utilizing that data to turn insights into what your readers want, you start to serve them things that are in line with your ability to extract value from them as opposed to the value that they themselves seek. And so from my perspective, the challenge that we have with the platforms that exist today, yes, of course it is, you, we can talk about the quality of the content on the platforms or we can talk about the quality of the discourse on the platforms, but it is very deeply embedded in the data collection business models that, that drive the entire internet ecosystem. 
Are, are you comfortable talking about maybe possible ways that Wikipedia um, can be expanded in terms, because it is a reliable um, source and... and um, we you know, trust no. but verify. Trust but verify. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, then what, let's let's address. YouTube came up earlier in Dana Boyd's um, talk, and and as as the place where more people go all the time. So, can you discuss a your specific relationship with YouTube, and then the larger question of uh, how we ensure that that kind of content is as 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 accurate as it can be. Um, yeah. So I think what what Doran's referring to is uh, YouTube is has. And Dana spoke about it earlier, is a place full of information that um, is often at, you know, the first video that you see may be really excellent and about sort of, uh, you know, the moon landing, and then the second video that you see is all about how the moon landing was faked in a soundstage in Arizona, right? Like, you very quickly fall down this rabbit hole of distrust, and so one of the things that, we, that YouTube did and made an announcement about a few months ago was that they would be using Wikipedia articles about what we call fringe theories, with you know conspiracy theories to the broader public, um, in labeling things like chem chemtrails and moon landings and the like with Wikipedia articles, sort of rebuffing them. I think that from our perspective, it is a good thing to see. We are very happy for the knowledge in Wikipedia to be used in meaningful ways in the world. We think that's really important. The idea that knowledge can be useful and help people make decisions and about things that affect their lives. And yet at the same time, I think that it is a, a deeply problematic thing when the, the entire commons, as Ryan was speaking about just a moment ago, becomes the way that these platforms sort of, they, they hand off the responsibility of curation and information to a commons that is fragile, that is under-resourced relative to the resources that, that larger commercial entities have, and often becomes the repository of some of the worst aspects of information manipulation, or as Dana said earlier, agnoto like the agnotological impulses of society and the internet as a whole. Um, so, you know, our, our position is both this is a good thing, but if we're going to do this, then we need to have a shared responsibility to the commons. The commons is not something that you show up and extract from unless you want the commons to go away. You're not actually a member of the commons unless you're participating and giving back to it. And in order to participate and give back to it, it can't just be from the value you derive. You also have to be investing in it in the long term. So our push for all of these big platforms is fine. If you want to use this, this information, by all means do. But then invest with us in making sure that the commons is sustainable, the commons is robust, the commons is diverse, the commons is representative. Because right now, today, it is not that. And if this is the only model upon which you're utilizing data to point people away from misinformation or train your machine learning algorithms or draw inferences as to the way what gender a word actually has, then we are just recapitulating the same broken system that has existed for so long. So on artificial intelligence, um, you wrote an op-ed um, uh, uh, that AI, if it goes on autopilot, can wreak havoc. So can you talk about some of the, I mean, Wikipedia, my last time I looked, about 20% or so is uh, bots. I mean, it uses some, Talk about some of the positive uses of AI and some of the dangers. Yeah, I mean, I th our machine-human interface, oh, we got to wrap it up. <laughs> our machine-human interface is not just, it, it's a, we start from the basis that you start with the humane. We start from the basis that the human is at the center of the machine-human interface and that bots and AI and, and whatever, however you want to describe machine learning is, must always be subordinate to the intentions of humans. And so if I were to summarize what we try to do as an approach, we try to start from the idea that it, this the way that these tools are used should be auditable. What is the intention of these tools and then what is the effect that they actually generate? The data sets that they trained on should be transparent and open and accessible and can also be subject to audit and continuously updated, particularly noting for errors, false positives, and, and bias, because that is just the big, one of the biggest challenges that AI faces today if it's going to be useful for the world and truly the world. And the last part is really around consent. Do people have the ability to consent to the way that machines are being used on them in shaping the spaces and environments in which they use, uh, in which it, the, shape, the spaces and the environments in which they exist? And so for us, Machine learning can only ever be used in a way that is meaningful if it is something that augments what humans can do in, in the intention of humans rather than being something that actually guides and shapes the decisions that we make. And that's why we totally diff we do not do guided news feeds. We do not do algorithmically generated suggestions because we think that that starts to shape the very direction of learning in ways that is actually divorced from perhaps potentially what it is that we as humans seek. 
Well, I think we're going to let you all go to your reception and get some food. Um, thank you, Catherine, very much. Thank you again to John Bracken and DPLA and all of you for here. You know, I've been I funded DPLA for seven years before it existed, and watching this thing take off and actually uh, become so successful and seeing the energy in this room is really a wonderful thing to behold. So um, thank you to every single one of you here for being part of this great movement. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Before you uh, take off, just a few quick notes. Um, my name is Adrian Turner. I'm part of the, uh, I represent uh, the Network Council, um, ser currently serving as chair. I think we talked about it earlier this morning. We're part of the uh, DPLA governance structure. Um, I just have a few quick comments, logistics, um, before you head out. Um, I know I'm just sort of the only thing standing between you and reception. So um, we're going to be upstairs on the ninth floor for reception. Um, so head all the way up, same place we had lunch. And... Um, we hope to see all of you up there. Uh, one thing to note is the coat reception, or I'm sorry, the coat check is upstairs. Uh, so go upstairs to the reception area, uh, enjoy you know, each other's company, and just make sure you uh, get your uh, uh, coat and bag there uh, once you leave or you know, check in there. Um, the other thing to note is after the reception, there's three birds of a feather session dinners. Uh, so you can sign up right outside the audit auditorium now for those birds of a uh, feather uh, dinners. Um, so you know, enjoy again good food, good good company, and you're gonna if, for those of you that are attending those birds of uh, a feather sessions, you'll meet at the registration desk at 7 p.m. So thank you all. See you upstairs.